Thank you all for joining us. If you will please state your name and who you represent for the record, you may begin your testimony. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. For the record, my name is Doug Smith. I'm, a, I'm the Senior Policy Analyst with the Texas Criminal Justice Coalition. And I thank you very much for this invitation. I uh, have some slides, and they address the totality of, of Charge 6. And so I may speed through some sections in the interest of time, because sure. you have my slides in front of you. And okay. there'll be public testimony tomorrow as well and so I would also great. like to I'd also like to point out that I'm a member of the substance use disorder coalition of Texas and several of our members have been coming around and talking to your offices and I really appreciate that um, and so I do represent the the SUD coalition today as well and there'll be several members coming around to give testimony tomorrow so in looking at uh, in looking at access to treatment services and preventing justice involvement, it's really difficult for us to not first look at what might have prevented that involvement in the first place, because we talk about what might happen when someone gets involved in the criminal justice system, but we might lose sight of the fact that people may have been trying to access services and found that difficult to do and got arrested during that period while they, were, while, while they were looking. We do have a rather sizable waiting list for services, so even when people do try to access services, anything from peer support to medication-assisted treatment, inpatient services, they're generally going to find an, a waiting list unless they fall into a certain priority population, such as a someone who might be pregnant, someone who might be an IV drug user. Otherwise, people will wait, and oftentimes the wait is rather lengthy. The, it's also important to recognize that wait lists obscure the sheer amount of need out there. Uh, we know that oftentimes people aren't on the waiting list because they simply don't know how to access services. In a survey of just medical providers in Travis County, a lot of them didn't even know how to access the OSAR mm -hmm. and didn't know how to advise clients. So uh, treatment access is a major problem. And one of the things that, that waiting lists don't show you is the rate of attrition off of that waiting list. I was touring downtown Austin with the downtown chief of police and uh, we went under a bridge and we met some folks that were known to the police and they happened to be homeless and the police officer knew that they were on the waiting list and they had absolutely no idea where they were on the waiting list mm -hmm. and had no way of finding out other than trying to get up to the shelter that day. So. Uh, waitlist attrition is a major problem. In a lot of cases, people are more likely to access services if they wear handcuffs first. Mm -hmm. And that's the real reality for a lot of Texans. So when we look at what's going on in the criminal justice system and the extent to which it is feeling the full weight of uh, substance use disorder in this state, uh, we can look no farther than the rate of, uh, of how offense categories are changing, who's coming into the courts. What we see is that Texas, by and large, is, is safer over the last five, ten years. We see almost every category of serious and or violent crime going down, or the number of those cases falling in the state, whereas the cases going up tend to be drug-related. Drug possession cases are up 25%, whereas burglary is down 26%. So we're seeing more and more arrests. There were 54,000 arrests last year just for possession less than four grams. And so what you see is a criminal justice system that is geared to and inclined to provide services for people to, in fact, to provide incentives for people to get into treatment, but a strained capacity to do so. And in the chart that I provided, um, thank yeah. you, you can see case outcomes for drug and property crimes. So drug and property crimes tend to be your state jail felonies. They tend to be the areas where uh, we Texas has traditionally tried to divert or at least had an intention to divert. Uh, the largest category are those either sentenced to state jail, local jail, or uh, prison. 
so we are a defendant is more likely to serve time than they are to be diverted into a community-based service and if they do serve time I think you already touched on this uh, Chairman White that they're more likely to continue to cycle in and out of the criminal justice system, whether they're serving that time in county jail on what's called a 1244, where they're doing felony time in county, or in state jail. They're more likely to continue to cycle. So it's imperative that we equip, that we try to prevent justice involvement, and if we don't, then to link people with services. So Harris County is kind of leading the way right now, uh, doing a marvelous job in, uh, we've been a hope that we could divert large proportions of the people being brought into the, into felony court on drug and drug related charges into some form of treatment and Harris County has done a marvelous job and I'm not gonna steal any of Judge Brock's uh, thunder. Uh, um, what I will say is that uh, the Smart on Crime Coalition, of which uh, Texas Criminal Justice Coalition is a member, has gone around the state to, to the uh, state prison system, to talk to members of the legislature, to talk to judges, DAs, law enforcement. We've talked to reentry providers, and we've talked to people who've been in and out of the criminal justice system. And what they tell us, by and large, is, not, is that most counties aren't Harris County. Remind us that we wish that we lived in a county that uh, had the resources to do this. And even Harris County is going to have some limitations, as you'll see. But don't have the capacity. Most courts do not have $2 million MacArthur grant. They don't have the investments from the county. They don't have the capacity to be able to gear serve necessary to serve 54,000 people arrested on a drug. So, but they did offer and I'm going to uh, I'm going to skip four slides to recommendations just the rest of time so what we heard was that what a county out in uh, Chairman White's neck of the woods or a, or a, a group of counties is going to be entirely different from uh, what counties you might need up in your area, Chairman. Uh, what they asked for is a system where uh, they're incentivized to continue to do pre to go to do more pretrial intervention, to do the arrest diversion in some cases. What they lack is the capacity, and what that and when I say capacity, is that different in Chairman White's district. We heard from county judges saying, we don't just need treatment capacity, we also need transportation to get them there. Mm -hmm. uh, that might be the same in yours. It probably is. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And so to have a community-driven uh, type of process where you could identify the needs, where you could partner with the criminal justice agencies, but also partner with HHSC, and perhaps with some investment from the state to promote pre- and post-arrest diversion to keep people out of our state jail system and serve them in the community, then local communities could build up the capacity that they deem is, is most, would be most effective in their area. And then the state could recoup its expenses as state jail commitments begin to decline, and you can take units offline. We also heard that uh, counties like Harris that are doing phenomenal work really should be that the defendant population that they're serving under pretrial intervention should be counted when we count who's in basic supervision. So uh, as you probably know, this, this population, you generally have to be placed on deferred adjudication or probation in order for the state to pay the capitated rate for probation. So if you're placed on a pretrial intervention, then that's generally going to be the, the county covering it unless they can get some grant funds to do it. We also heard that a possible funding mechanism could be, let's look at a graduated series of 
sentences for possession-related offenses. So uh, emphasizing pretrial intervention on early offenses, community supervision, and even if incarceration is warranted, ensuring that people leave that period of incarceration with some services, aftercare, and supervision the way that the state jail was intended. And finally, and I, I bring this up on a personal point, I was working with a, I was um, trying to help a family friend whose son was getting out of state jail recently. And uh, the, she was very, very concerned that he was going to be going back to use of drugs. And indeed he did. Um, I tried to tell her about the community resources that were available. Um, but he didn't access them sooner, uh, soon enough, and he did have an overdose, and he did die. Mm. And so um, it's just imperative that that form of assessment is done early. If someone is, uh, is staying within the county jail or has be re been referred to the state jail, that we identify opiate use disorder early and that we ensure access to medication-assisted treatment or link them with the uh, access sites that the um, that Lisa Ramirez brought up uh, that HHSC is trying to bring online. And I had some other recommendations related to child protection. Um, I'd be happy to talk about them. They, uh, I think that we see this as some of the downstream effects. Mm -hmm. What we've heard is that just like people in the criminal justice system might be looking for services, people in the child protection services, uh, child protection uh, system may have been looking for services prior to any involvement of CPS. And improving access to uh, treatment services that allow people to get, uh, to get into treatment prior to their child being taken away, or even better, allowing them to bring their children with them would help to alleviate that. So, and I know that more of the folks from the SUD coalition will be here tomorrow to talk in depth about this. Great. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith, any questions, members? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, we're going to leave the best for last. So Harris <laughs> County will uh, go last. My name is Elizabeth Henneke. I am the executive director of a new nonprofit called the Lone Star Justice Alliance. We're a year old. And essentially what we do is we go out to counties, we ask them what they need to create and develop alternative incarceration programs for youth and emerging adults, and then we provide it. That can be everything from getting public-private funding. So we are independently funded. We go to counties and we say, what do you need? What funding do you need? Let me go out and get you a grant. We've been very successful. We've gotten about $4 million um, for Dallas and Williamson County to create alternative incarceration programs. We actually expect to hit $6 million. Um, um, by the end of this calendar year and we're in our first year. So that's what we do. Our background is I'm an attorney, former law professor, and my colleague is a social worker and um, has a degree from the LBJ school. She used to be one of y'all. She was one of the clerks for the calendars committee. Um, so I want to talk to you today about three things. One, I want to emphasize what everyone has said, and I'm a lawyer so I'm really direct. We do not have sufficient funding to support those who have substance abuse and opioid um, use disorders here in Texas. And I want to applaud this body for making sincere steps to increase that. So you've seen behavioral health spending increase since 2013. I think you're doing a really good job, but we have further to go. So if we're going to talk about money, because that's what every single recommendation has concluded with, right? Let's talk about what that looks like. And let's talk about my suggestions for how you spend that money okay so first I want to talk a little bit about um, and my paper covers more than this but I'm just gonna get down to the bottom line I want to talk a little bit about what programs that we through our research have found to be incredibly helpful for people because you're gonna hear a lot about specialty courts but there's a range of programs one is that um, we have seen that programs that are DA driven can be incredibly helpful, incredibly um, supportive. So one of those examples, of course, is uh, what's happening out of Harris County. We see specialty courts as a really positive um, program as well, but ultimately alternatives to incarceration that actually redirect individuals out of the criminal justice system and into community-based services are by far the most effective uses of every dollar in Texas because it bolsters community-based 
police services that are available to all, not just those who arrive in handcuffs. As Doug mentioned, you literally, with my clients, I cannot get them in services until I put them in a jail. I have to put them in jail to get them services. That just should not be the case. And the reason for that is because what we've done is we've invested statewide in criminal justice-based treatment programs rather than community-based treatment programs. Dr. Sheffield, I assume that you would much rather have programs invested in your community that can apply to everyone and not just those who have handcuffs on them. So I want to talk to you about what those might look like and how we would do that. So we took a look at a survey around the country of those treating young adults, because this is the highest risk population here in Texas and nationally. And we looked at all sorts of programs and we found several characteristics that defined successful programs. So one, they had intensive individualized case management. So just like everything else, paper referrals don't work. So if you tell me to go visit my local substance abuse inpatient treatment, I'm not going to go. I'm going to go down and hang out with my friends. But if you walk me over there, you provide me peer supports throughout the entire process, I'm going to be much more likely to be engaged in it. Two, I'm going to echo what Carrie said earlier, which is a risk needs responsivity tool is absolutely necessary. And this is on page five of my prepared document. What this does is it allows us to actually identify what individuals need and treat only what they need, not what we think they need. Because we don't want to let our independence, our um, own judgments guide what we think individuals need. We actually want the science to guide it. We need specialized uh, skill training with directed practice. This means knowing best practices. So motivational interviewing, um, cognitive behavioral techniques. We need to make sure um, that we actually have staff that can effectively do this. You heard this from um, Camille Kane earlier when she testified about we need our staff to be able to deliver. It, you need to engage with the entire community in restorative justice practices because the individuals who have been harmed, the children, the wives, the mothers, need to be able to have a voice in this process. The survivors of those who commit crime need to be engaged throughout the entire process. We need an incentive-based behavioral response system. Positive supports are much more effective than negative supports. This is why the handcuffs don't work. It's why recidivism rates in the state jail are incredibly high versus pretrial diversion programs, which have much more success. Finally, we need to measure our processes and practice so that we know that the outcomes are successful. You all should not just be paying for number of people in a program. You need to be paying for who actually succeeds in their communities. So lastly, I want to close with, rec with three recommendations. One, Texas should really look at adopting alternatives to incarceration that direct people out of criminal justice programs and into their community so that all can benefit from health and human services. Two, we should pay particular attention to emerging adults who have incredibly high rates of recidivism. Recent numbers that just came out last week indicate nationally it's 85% recidivism rates. And finally, Texas should consider creating an innovation fund. And this fund should take the best practices that counties have been developing all around the state and give them state funding to expand and to educate their peers. We suggest relying upon the Pew Charitable Trust's evidence-based policymaking guide, which sets out a framework for actually evaluating which programs are working and how we should fund them. So we recommend a rigorous fund that makes sure that whatever dollars go, go only to positive outcomes for individuals and community. Ms. Henneke, that's great thank testimony, you. and thank you for your written. I know there's a lot more in here than what you were <laughs> able to just uh, cover, but those recommendations are, are uh, good for us to consider, and I appreciate you doing that, and congratulations on your first year. Thank Sounds you. Sounds very successful. <laughs> we appreciate it. Members, any questions of Ms. Henneke? I welcome phone calls from your local communities. Thank you. You probably will receive them. I'm <laughs> Appreciate it very much. You. Judge, you may proceed. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members, for the opportunity to uh, speak before you today. Uh, by way of background, my name is Brock Thomas. I am currently assigned as presiding judge over the Harris County Responsive Intervention for Change, otherwise known as the RIC docket. In addition to that, I also preside over both dockets of our uh, Harris County Felony Mental Health Court program, one of which is a docket that addresses specifically individuals with both mental health 
issues along with co-occurring substance use disorders. Uh, I also, since 2016, have served as a member of the Judicial Advisory Council for the Criminal Justice Assistance Division of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice and served as a criminal district judge from 2002 to 2008 and again from 2013 to 2016. I also presided over one of Harris County's drug courts from 2005 to 2008. Uh, although I do preside currently over a specialty court, specifically the Felony Mental Health Court Program, I know since Judge Reyes and others will speak more specifically uh, to the history, the purposes, processes, and effectiveness of specialty courts, uh, I will spend the majority of my time talking specifically about the RIC docket, uh, which is a docket rather than a specialty court, and I'll try to address that as I work through my remarks. Uh, by way of information, we've also included, with the assistance and the preparation of Dr. May, written materials that uh, explain in more detail our RIC docket, some of the numbers behind it, and some of the results to date. The RIC docket itself was established and started in October of 2016 as part of a Harris County strategy, part of the Harris County MacArthur Foundation Safety Justice Challenge grant. The MacArthur Safety Justice Challenge, for those not familiar with it, is an initiative that seeks to address uh, in a safe way over-reliance on the utilization of jails and to attempt to safely reduce the number of people that are sent to jail, how long they stay there. Uh, and to reduce uh, racial and ethnic disparities within the jail population itself. Um, as a result of that, the RIC docket, which was created in 2016, which was, as was mentioned before, which is a collaborative effort between the courts uh, in Harris County, Harris County government itself, uh, the probation department, and obviously the district attorney, it is a collaborative effort where, as opposed to before, where all state jail less than a gram cases, all one to four possession cases, and even felony prostitution cases, which we take, which is a smaller number comparatively, as opposed to those cases being distributed randomly among 22 district courts, all of those cases now are uh, uh, are distributed and come through one centralized docket. Uh, that is the RIC docket that I preside over. Uh, that's about, we estimate this year, about 5,000 cases that we would be touching that would be coming through. All of the less than a gram possession cases, all of the one to four possession cases, and again, those prostitution fourth cases. The idea behind the docket is to attempt to address the things that were mentioned before, over-reliance on local and state jails, high recidivism rates, and racial and ethnic disparity among low-level drug offenders through diversion to community supervision, either pretrial intervention, which has been discussed for first-time felony matters, or deferred adjudication for those with prior felony history. The pretrial interventions for those with no felony histories are year-long contracts that with appropriate programming under treatment based upon proper assessment, results in the dismissal of the case upon successful completion with the availability of expungement of the arrest. In terms of understanding what we do, I want to provide a little context as to how we got there and why the docket was begun because it will provide some information that hopefully will be helpful. As the data shows in the accompanying materials, when we looked at prior to RIC, if we looked at our jail population, specifically the pretrial population, the detainees, we could see that of that population, which was obviously a significant number, a large amount of those individuals were individuals on lower level state jail felony cases. A lot of those were drug possession cases. And a lot of those we, had, we could see an overrepresentation for people of color within that population. When we look further at those that were in jail with that, you could see, and the data shows this, individuals that are at, in jail at the time of disposition of their case are much more likely to have their case resolved or take a, uh, a disposition of their case that results in some kind of confinement. And so what we saw as a result of those things were over time pre-RIC, we had in Harris County, because of that and the high numbers of that, a disproportionate number of people that we were sending to state jail. And of those people we're sending to state jail, many of those were coming back again and again and again. Comparatively speaking, if you look at the individuals that were being sent to state jail versus similarly situ situated individuals that were placed on some type of community supervision, those that were sentenced to state or local jail were being rearrested re at a significantly higher rate than those that were diverted to some type of community supervision. That is the, the backdrop as to the why as to the, the docket was started. Through the docket, and you can see, I think it's on page three of the materials that provided a flowchart that 
seeks to summarize how the docket, docket works uh, and is as described there. Cases initially flow through this socialized docket, which allows us, as appropriate, to quickly divert individuals, again, as appropriate, away from jail to either pretrial diversion or deferred adjudication with corresponding programming and or treatment, which is driven by assessment to address the individualized needs of the participant, stressing, obviously, the assessment. People come and become justice involved for all kinds of different reasons. They have all kinds of different things going on when they become justice involved. If we're going to effectively get people to the appropriate diversion, we need to make sure we're matching and meeting the individualized needs of the persons in front of us. So assessment is important to what we do. The things that we utilize as part of the docket, understanding that when since all of those cases come through, there are some number of those cases that um, people may wish to have a trial, a motion to suppress, or their case may be dismissed. There's an opportunity for cases to transfer out and not stay with us. But if the ones that do stay with us, obviously our approach is, when appropriate, to divert people to appropriate programming and treatment. We use a, an array of programming options to do that, everything from outpatient treatment in the community to all the other in the spectrum, uh, various forms of secure residential treatment. This also includes as well referrals to our various specialty court programs, our drug courts, our mental health court, our veterans court programs as appropriate. Having previously served as a drug court judge and, and now serving as a mental health court judge, obviously I have seen over time the effectiveness and how our specialty courts can be an effective tool in assisting individuals with substance related issues, particularly those that are utilizing services on the higher end of the spectrum that either have not shown an ability to successfully complete and navigate some type of supervision or there's a high likelihood without the type of support services and things in addition to treatment that specialty courts provide that there would be a high likelihood that they would not succeed. So hopefully what I'm able to convey is the RIC docket is a docket. Our idea and the goal is to get people what they need, whatever that may be. That can be everything from a lower level touch that's done in the community across the spectrum to a high level touch where it may be some type of secure residential treatment. In addition to linking people with appropriate treatment, we also seek to link participants with often needed recovery support services. For example, um, many people will discuss the, discuss the use of peer support or recovery coaches. We actually have three recovery coaches that are contracted with us that are in the courtroom every day and assigned specifically our, to our docket who can assist individuals either pretrial as they're navigating their case or even once there's a disposition and referral to some type of diversion. So we're able to do that right then and there. We also, through the local mental health authority, have uh, uh, three individuals with the local mental health authority that are in our courtroom every day to where we can make appropriate referrals and linkages right there. I'll say specifically with regard to opiate related substance abuse issues, being mindful that since we deal with all of the substance cases, the less than a gram and one to fours, obviously we deal with a significant number of the opioid uh, related matters as well. Uh, for those individuals that were able to divert to some type of appropriate programming, in addition to specialized to officers who have specialized training uh, in assisting individuals that are dealing with that particular issue, training in recognition of misuse, abuse, dependence, as well as risk of um, indicators of relapse and also um, antidote for overdose information such as that. We also, for individuals where an opiate use history is provided, we also are providing, and through our CSCD, uh, medically assisted treatment information packets, which are given to individuals that can include information used for the participant, caregivers, information on medications uh, used to treat it, as well as information on potential resources to access. To be clear, I do not, we do not require individuals to participate in medically assisted treatment. Certainly information is given, and that is the decision that ultimately needs to be made based upon the participant's willingness along with consultation with the appropriate medical professional to decide the appropriateness of that uh, person's participated in it and the suitability for such. For those that do, and we do have a number that do participate in medically assisted treatment, it crosses the gamut of people that are already accessing it by the time they come our way through some type of either private insurance or private care to people that may either have or do decide to access it through either community resources or clinics to even through our CSED residential programming and our higher level intensive outpatient, people being able to be linked with an addiction psychiatrist if necessary for that. Being a year and a half into our doc at this point, we have seen some significant results. Before where we saw 
pre-Rick, as I had mentioned before, when you back out dismissals, about 80% of the people were taking time and about 20% were taking supervision. Now we've flipped it. We have about 85% backing out dismissals and backing out those that transfer out. Those that stay with us, that we dispose of at RIC, about 85% are taking some type of diversion, either pretrial diversion or divert adjudication versus 15% that are taking some form of confinement. Obviously, that's significant and it's completely flipped it. Now, the challenge that that presents us, which is not a challenge uh, that is unique to us, is uh, from a system standpoint, when you still have, uh, for lack of a way to put it, a, a finite uh, amount of resource that's out there within a system, and you totally you turn it upside down from 80% taking time to 85% taking some type of diversion, you are going to stretch further an already stretched system in terms of the continuum of resources that we utilize. Again, everything from treatment, resource that's accessed out in the community through various community providers to all the way across the spectrum to more of our high-end residential settings. Um, so that's at least some of the things that we've seen with that. Again, the challenge is certainly we have increased the number of justice-involved individuals diverted to treatment, and that's a significant step towards our goal of better serving this population. But obviously the need for access to timely utilization to the array of treatment alternatives is key to longer-term success. Because after all, effective diversion is more than just diverting people away from jail, it's diverting people towards things that can appropriately help them and assist them going forward. Uh, getting back again to justice-involved individuals dealing with opioid-related substance use issues, uh, through the consolidation of all these cases in one docket, we get obviously a vast majority of the substance use cases total, so obviously we get a large number of the opioid-related cases. It's difficult to put a number to what it represents. We can, through some of the information, speak to about 8% that in our assessments and so forth at least identify as some type of opiate-related issue. But obviously, when we're talking about, we're, we're speaking to the justice-involved individuals that we're dealing with here. It's a whole different uh, uh, um, issue when you're talking about non-justice-involved individuals. But for our justice-involved individuals, even with that, people get arrested for a certain type of substance that may not totally uh, indicate the substances that they're using. We get people, for example, that are arrested for methamphetamine cases that really are opiate users and have switched for whatever reason to meth. I can say whether that 8%, um, probably it's certainly more than that. It's hard to put an exact number on it. Those are at least ones that are identified with it. Proportionally, what we can tell is it's, it's a growing issue in Harris County. Hard to put an exact number with it. It still proportionally doesn't size up with the number of cases we see, individuals with substance use disorders dealing with cocaine, methamphetamine, things of that nature, but it is growing. But what we also do see is because of how addictive opiates are, and obviously the significant risk of overdose. Um, they are utilizing a lot of the people that are working with a lot more proportion of the higher end of our resources in terms of treatment resources as would be expected. With our higher level, a greater utilization of our higher level intensive outpatient and even our various residential treatment options. So uh, I know that's a, a lot of information I provided. It's difficult to cover it in so, so much in so little time. Dr. May has uh, provided uh, the, some materials for your review. Thank you for the chance to speak with you and uh, welcome any questions you might have. Thank you, Judge. Uh, you're doing a great job with the rig docket. That's uh, super information for this committee to hear. Um, I think there are a couple of members that have questions. Uh, Chairman Alvarado. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a, a comment. Thank you, Judge, for giving the report on what Harris County is doing. I know that other counties might not be in the position uh, to, to replicate what we're doing, but it's certainly something to strive for. And I, this has been um, a work in progress, and you're, you've, just, you've worked it down now to a science, and you've fine-tuned it, and thank you for your work, and appreciate what the DA's office is doing as well, Kim Ma, I know this is something that's been um, a priority for her office, so it's I'm happy to see that it's it's happening and it's working. You're impacting people's lives, sometimes make saving people's lives as well, just um, by the fact that you've got all these partners working together and there's so many components to it and really proud of what the, the final result has been. As was indicated before, um, I, I'm blessed to have the opportunity to preside over the docket, but it is a collaborative effort of all the individuals that you've mentioned. And, uh, and uh, I especially want to 
uh, our officers, our supervision officers who are working with these individuals. Um, we collectively are making the effort to divert people, but obviously the heavy lifting and the hard work occurs um, once the individuals are given the chance at diversion. And that's one of the things that we seek to do is that we are built to be able to work through these situations. It's not just a placement on diversion and then it's out of sight and out of mind for that point. They continue to stay with our docket and we're prepared to continue to work with these individuals. Anybody that's being assessed at needing any um, uh, high level of treatment, either an intensive outpatient or some type of residential, we, sh we know and expect that we're going to have to continue to work at that. That's just expected. Uh, if it worked by just telling people no and that they would stop doing it, then um, you know the, the need for treatment wouldn't be there. But obviously it is. And uh, it's through the efforts of all of those individuals and, and, and all of the work and all of the stakeholders that we're able to do this. We're still a work in progress. We're still more towards the beginning than we are towards the end. But um, we continue to work at the things we're doing well and try to fix the things that we need to do better. Thank you. Chairman White. Was there anyone else in front of me? Okay. Thank you very much, Judge, for your testimony, and um, I'm very proud of the work that you and your team are doing in Harris County. Um, some folks in this in this lane have stated that they need more leverage to get people to probably go through a, a writ court uh, as far as even extending uh, some of the sentences beyond two years in state jail. Now, I'm, I'm not for that. I, I don't see the logic behind that, but. Um, because there are probably people looking at this out in, in um, video streaming land. So how do you get them to, of course, you got all the other the legal procedure you have to go through, but generally, how do we get them to see that this is the, the best alternative for them? And, you know, you got the defense attorneys out there sure. doing their thing, you know. Okay. Sure. Uh, you know, obviously, there are many different opinions about ways to go to this. We're not here to suggest that there were the only way to address it. I, what I will say is I think just about everyone across the board recognizes and understands that, um, and this is something that I learned as a drug court judge, and it took a while to really come to, to speak to this, and I know Judge Reyes will speak to this more, you know, having that opportunity to do that, which informs kind of how I approach these cases going forward, and understanding when dealing with these substance cases, um, the reality that treatment works and recovery is possible. But when we're looking at diverting people away from jail towards something, as I've mentioned before, we do have to look at the realities of not just the programming that we are connecting people with, but how are we incentivizing people to make the decision to participate in it? And I say that because for our first time felony cases, um, the offer of the pretrial intervention, which is a year-long contract as opposed to most of our deferreds that are two or three years that can be early terminated. But for many people, that's a big deal. And that's an incentive. It's shorter. It's a year. I can do something like that. I do need some kind of help. That's a doable thing. The reality of with the pretrial interventions, being able to get a dismissal at the end of that in an expungement to where it does not get in the way of individuals being able to get employment, housing, and all the other things flow from that. I think can be of great benefit. The reality that we all have, that I know we understand, but sometimes it's it, to, to step back and remind ourselves of it, we deal with, with our docket, a lot of people that have cycled through the system again and again. Mm -hmm. Every one of those people were a first offender at some point. Mm -hmm. The better we do with the first offenders, okay. the better that we are going to change the trajectory of how we handle and dispose of these cases. If we can get that right, and we continue to have to continue to work at it, I think we can we can change things and it can be a significant generational change with how we've done that. Um, so I, I, I know everybody in every jurisdiction has to come at it, you know, from their own perspective with their own concerns and their own ideas. I think for us, mm -hmm. um, for the first time felony offenders, when everybody agrees that getting them the right kind of treatment on the right track is the right thing to do, and if we do that and get that in the right way and do it in a way that it does the, inhibit their ability later on to work and to move on with life, everybody's kind of better for that. So, And just to make sure I don't get myself into some other issues, uh, <laughs> as chair of corrections, I often get the sensational Facebook post. Uh, about people on supervision in Harris County, maybe parole mostly, but some type of supervision. I think the uh, the governor's just came out with a high-profile proposal on bail. So uh, do you, you don't have any sensational stories about people on on these bond programs in your um, uh, 
out of your court. Um, we have people that succeed. We have people yeah. that fail. Um, but that's sensational know, stuff. Yeah, <laughs> it's hard to think yeah. off the top of my head. Okay. Um, but when you're dealing with numbers of this size, uh, it's not going to be perfect, and there will always be those circumstances. We try to do and make decisions, uh, inform decisions about the best way forward, and individualize matters on individualized cases as best we can. Chair. Uh, yes. Chairman, if I could just add one thing to, in response to Chairman White that I think is really helpful to also think through in addition to what um, the judge said is fees are a huge driver of incentives. So is it, what, what is it? Fees. Okay. So when we make probation um, out of reach of a lot of those who are indigent, we discourage people from taking it. Um, jail becomes a swifter quicker option for them to get back to work, to get out of the debts that are plaguing them. And I think there is a general perception amongst individuals who come before the criminal justice system that probation is too expensive, that probation is unaccessible to the vast, to too many who are trying to make it each day. And so I think fees have got to be a part of any conversation that you're talking about when you're charging anywhere from $375 a month and $360 a month for an okay. let me, interlocked let me, let me just treat that just a little bit. Okay, fees. Yes, sir. Okay, and, and I agree with you. Um, you know, I, yeah. I usually have an, an anthem against any type of fees, driver's <laughs> license, anything. Okay, but now, is someone in, is is someone coaching them up on that, counseling them on that? I mean, I'm I'm thinking about someone coming in at one a.m. in the morning, um, struggling with addiction, and and they're processing all of these scenarios. I think there's some other people coaching them up on this, right? Well, I think an attorney, a defense attorney, is required and obligated to outline any offers that so, come forward. So, the defense, so they would tell them, you're going to be required to pay $75 a month in probation. And you're fees, too poor and you're too interlock. broke, so you need, to go to, you need to go to state jail for but, six months. The consequences of how it applies to an individual, defense attorneys, I would hope, would say, mm -hmm. you know, think through treatment. You say you want to yeah. change your life. But we, I think we're obligated to advise our clients as to what the financial ramifications are of any plea so that they can be thoughtful about what they are signing up for. It's part of disclosure to make sure that they understand the consequences of what they're um, signing up for. And I frequently see clients who will take jail time. Okay. And they'll take the six and, months and, overpaying and, the fees and, and, and we're paying the, like it's a yeah, it, gotcha the, system. But the public is paying the defense attorney to tell them this stuff if they're indigent. Well, I think it's required by, I mean, yes. yeah. I mean, the Constitution okay. requires all defense yeah. attorneys to do it. Right, they but, have to but, be but, the but if, the, if it's an indigent appointment, mm -hmm. the public is paying for it. Yes, sir. And the public is paying for them to sit in the county jail. And then the public is paying for them to recycle on and on and on from state jail to county jail. Okay, just wanted to put that out because yeah. I, I think the judge brings up a good point about the collaborative effort. And I think collaboratively, defense attorneys, DAs, judges should all be up here at this table saying, you know, the way we're doing this is not right and we should be doing some other things. Okay, so, and, and maybe they should be saying, you know, you should relieve the fees, you could do this so we can do the work that uh, Judge Thomas and you guys should come up and find. So it should be a collaborative effort. So I hear you there, but I think there's some officials in the in the in the thing in the in the continuum mm -hmm. that are also you know winning in this collateral damage of folks. Okay. Members, any additional questions for this panel? Thank you very much. That was great information. We appreciate y'all being here today.